عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وافضل الصلاة واتم التسليم على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته everyone uh, welcome back to تفسير سورة الأعراف Heights of the Hereafter. We had concluded last week with verse 165. So actually I wanted to add one more comment regarding verse 165. So we could just turn to that um, until that's where I want to start off with uh, today. So just to remind us of the verse, uh, let's look at it one more time. أنجينا الذين ينهون عن السوء وأخذنا الذين ظلموا بعذاب بئيس بما كانوا يفسقون. Okay, verse 165, which means then when they forgot what they had been exhorted, we delivered those who forbade evil and afflicted the wrongdoers with their grievous punishment because of their evil doing. So remember we had spoken about uh, the Sabbath and how there was a party from among Bani Israel that broke. Uh, the Sabbath, and this caused the you know wrath of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to descend upon them, as we're going to see. Um, and there was one group of people that used to forbid them from uh, you know breaking the Sabbath, and there was another party that was quiet, and then there was a third party that was actually uh, actively breaking the Sabbath. So we had mentioned last week regarding the silent ones, the ones who did not themselves break the Sabbath nor did they stop those that were breaking it. So they were quiet. So we had mentioned uh, two positions of the um, scholars on what happened to those that were quiet, who didn't forbid the evil, but didn't do uh, it themselves, didn't break the Sabbath themselves. So we had mentioned Sheikh Zuhaili's position that the Quran is silent regarding um, them in the sense that there's not an explicit statement uh, about them. And so Sheikh Zuhaili mentioned that we don't know what happened to them but then he also mentions a second position where he says that most scholars so although there is no clear um you know open quranic statement regarding them um most uh, scholars we had mentioned um take the position that they were saved but instead of saying most it is more accurate to say that the preferred position of the scholars is that these individuals were Saved. Okay, so instead of saying most scholars want to be more accurate and say that it is the preferred position, as Sheikh Zuhili mentions in his tafsir, and that preferred position is that uh, these individuals were saved. But what I wanted to add today was a third position that I did not mention last week, so I just want you to be aware of it in case you come across it, just wanted to be on your radar. There is a third position um, scholars take, for example, Maududi rahimahullah um, ta'ala, he mentions that these individuals that did not break the Sabbath themselves, but also failed to admonish and stop the ones that were breaking the Sabbath. So this was like the silent party, right? Uh, the ones that were telling those who were forbidding the evil, why are you even bothering with forbidding the evil? Well, let's going to punish these people anyway. So they themselves were not doing it, but they were not stopping the ones that were doing it. There is a third position which uh, states that these individuals were also overtaken by punishment. Okay, so um, the evidence that they present, the, the, for example, the evidence he presents for this position that even um, those who stayed quiet and didn't forbid the evil, the fact that they were overtaken by punishment is... Um, found in this verse 165 in and of itself, where it says that when the, then when they uh, forgot what they had been exhorted, we delivered those who forbade evil. Okay, so um, he says that it's clear that the ones that were saved, it's clear from the verse that they were the ones who were actively for, forbidding the evil, okay? And then it was, you know, everyone else, as the verse says, afflicted the wrongdoers with the grievous punishment because of their evil doing. So, uh, he uses this verse in and of itself as evidence for the fact that the only party that is categorically saved is the party that used to forbid evil. And then um, he mentions other evidences like a uh, verse from the Quran, Surah Al-Anfal, verse 25, um, which speaks about fitna. Which means, and beware of the fitna or punishment that will not fall only on the wrongdoers among you. Beware of the fitna or the scourge. It will not only fall 
only on the wrongdoers among you and know that Allah is severe in punishment. Okay. So just wanted to mention that so you're aware of the fact that this position also exists, the one that considers that those that did not forbid evil were also overtaken by the punishment. Wallahu ta'ala alam and Allah knows best. Okay, uh, with that, let's start our new verse for today, verse 166. Falamma, so when Atho, they persisted, uh, regarding that which they had been forbidden from doing, Qulna, we said, Lahum to them, Kunu, become Kiradatan, Kiradatan, yani apes. Khasi'in despised, 166. And when they persisted in pursuing that which had been forbidden, we said, become despised apes. Okay. Um, verse 166. Realize that the ones that were forbidding evil, uh, the evil of breaking the Sabbath, were the Muslims of that time, were the Muslims of Bani Israel who are actively acting on the command to honor the Sabbath. And when the, those Muslims from Bani Israel saw that their words were not being heeded. They separated themselves from the people that were violating the Sabbath. The, the seed mentioned that they actually built a physical wall between themselves and those um, that were violating uh, the Sabbath, right? And so uh, it is mentioned that once it became very silent, um, the part of the town where the Sabbath breakers used to live. So the Muslims went out to see, you know, why is there, uh, you know, so much silence. And they found that those individuals had been transformed into apes. Uh, and this is actually mentioned here in this verse. And um, you will find the opinion that this is metaphorical. However, from the words of the Quran and many of the uh, tafsirs, um, you will see that this is actually meant as a physical transformation, okay? And what was really sad about this situation is that these individuals, the Sabbath breakers that were turned into apes, were physically transformed, but they retained their mental cognition. When they saw their relatives from among the good people, from among the Muslims, they recognized uh, their relatives. And, it, and the Tafsir even mentions that um, they would go to their family members, go next to them and actually weep because of the, uh, tr their transformation. Uh, they, uh, you know, the transformed individuals would weep over themselves and then their family or the people they would be crying next to would tell them, did we not tell you to desist from your uh, behavior? Okay, so they retained their mental cognition. They remembered and recognized their family members, which is he mentions that their minds were allowed to remain intact, their bodies were changed into those of apes. Just imagine the type of, you know, mental torment uh, that is, you know, an unspeakable punishment in and of itself. Regarding the partaking of the fish that these people took and eating of the fish and the selling of the fish, everything that they enjoyed of that uh, meal or of that fish, Hassan al-Basri, he says something so insightful. He says this, and the big white fish was the worst food that anyone in the world ever ate, that had the heaviest humiliation in this world and the longest adab in the next world. This was probably the most expensive meal in all of human history that those from Bani Israel paid such a heavy price for. What is the lesson in this for us? Sin is never worth it. It always has too heavy of a price that is paid for. And no matter how tempting it may appear, no matter how lucrative and financially beneficial it may appear, sin is never ever worth the price that it costs, right? And sometimes when we go too far in sinning and transgressing, we may lose something that we can then never regain. Some people, when they go off track, lose Iman in such a way that it becomes really difficult to come back. Some people lose their innocence and cannot re regain it again. And in the extreme case of Iblis, sinning and transgression caused him everything where he fell from the ranks of worshiping with the angels to the one who literally cannot have hope in the mercy of Rahman, the mercy of the most merciful. So remember the lesson we mentioned about how the temptation, the trial is according to the level of fisk, 
according to the level of disobedience and rebelliousness, right? So the more rebellious and godless uh, a person, an individual, a community is, the more tempting and more difficult to resist their temptations will be. So we have to be really careful in an attitude of daring when it comes to sin. Beware of an attitude of fearlessness when it comes to committing sin. You know, the attitude of, oh, let's just see what happens. You know, let's just do it, right? Isn't that how the Sabbath breakers started out? Like, let's see if something happens, right? When the one person took that one fish and started one day, right? It did start one day. Um, and when nothing happened, you know, then the daring and the fiercelessness just increased uh, from that point, right? And the sin became extra uh, alluring and it was extra uh, beautified and something that could not be given up, something that they saw so tempting, they could not give it up for a God that they could not see, for a rape that could not yet be experienced, okay? Um, so this is why they were, uh, you know, overtaken by this, dreadful punishment if you think about how horrible their punishment was you know physical transformation to apes and if we reflect upon why they this happened to them well look what the verse says verse 160 says uh, 166 when they persisted when they persisted stubbornly persisted in violation of doing what they were told not to do we said to them be disgraced apes another translation of adaw which a stubborn persistence uh, in the verb form, stubbornly persisted. Another translation is when they boldly went beyond what they were allowed, or when they boldly went beyond what they were forbidden uh, from doing. It was said to them, become, uh, be like despised apes or become rejected apes. You know, so think of how hateful this persistence in sin is to Allah's fantasy, uh, you know, um, made them undergo this transformation. Okay, let's look to verse 167. And when the Adhana proclaimed, Rabbuka, your Lord, we shall surely send, we shall surely send alayhim upon them, ila until yawm al qiyamah, the day of judgment, man, ones, or people, uh, man literally means whose, okay, it means those or who, although it's in the singular, yasumuhum, those who will ruthlessly oppress them. Su al adab, yani a horrible, painful, ruthless uh, adab or persecution. Inna indeed arabaka, your Lord, la sari'ah, la sari'ah lam is for uh, emphasis, la sari'ah al aqab. Sari'ah is quick. Al uh, aqab, punishment. Indeed, your Lord is quick in punishment. Wa innahu, and indeed he, la ghafur lam for emphasis, is indeed. Ghafoor, one who forgives, Rahim, the one of um, all merciful, one filled with mercy, right? Um, so verse 167, and recall when your Lord proclaimed that he would continually, continuously set an authority over them till the day of judgment, those who would ruthlessly oppress them, surely your Lord is swift in punishing, and yet he is all forgiving, all merciful. Verse 167, if you look at the Arabic, يسومهم سوء العذاب يسومهم يعني يذيقهم make them taste سوء العذاب the uh, painful or the humiliating tyranny humiliating uh, punishment okay and um, if you look at uh, Yahya Emmerich's translation he mentions while well, commenting on this verse about the suffering of the later generations of Bani Israel right and how their suffering is recorded in the book of uh, in the Old Testament itself, in the books of Lamentations and Amos. Um, so you can actually find biblical corroboration for something we know uh, to have historically occurred as well. So, you know, think about what led to such a terrifying divine proclamation that Allah Subhanahu wa would, until the day of judgment, set upon these individuals, people uh, that would subject them to the worst type of ruthless, humiliating, tyranny and punishment. This in fact was the first punishment that they uh, received, uh, th that they would have these types of rulers placed over them who would subject them to the most uh, severest of punishments. It is a tragic manifestation of how much they displeased Allah subhanahu wa to what extent they angered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, you know, um, something 
from which we can directly understand how it is insanity to think that sins, especially repeated, bold sins, continuous, um, you know, sinning and transgression boldly with audacity and arrogance and not uh, heeding the calls of people admonishing and stopping um, how that will lead to consequences. It is insanity to think that such sin would not result in a consequence until the day of judgment they will have to pay for their sins according to this uh, verse. And we have seen this historically play out throughout their uh, tragic history, right? So the lesson we extract is that we cannot consider any sin minor because we don't know how major it may be in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? People, when they're involved in committing major sins, are not contemplating how major that sin is in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or they would probably desist or become less willing participants or repent, right? So no sin should be regarded minor because it may be major in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may hold major consequences starting in this world. Now, here it behooves us to reflect for a moment on what their sins actually were. Why? Because remember the Prophet ﷺ warned us against how we would behave exactly like the former communities, like the Jews and the Christians. So uh, if we have that warning from our Prophet ﷺ, then we have to reflect on what were their sins so that we may not mimic their behavior. Well, obviously one is the killing of their prophets. Right? Alhamdulillah, we don't have to worry about uh, that. The sounding of the Sabbath, right, which has been the topic of these verses, how by finding loopholes, right, they weren't actually taking the Sabbath out on Saturday, right, but they were making sure that it would be caught on Saturday and then they could take it out on Sunday. Finding loopholes is certainly not something the Muslim community is immune from, right? Um, superficially adhering to the letter of the law while dishonoring its a spirit while not um, also manifested not holding reverence and awe for what the deen holds uh, or reveres right holds an awe and has reverence for the sha'air the signs and symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not be uh, to not have the respect and reverence in our hearts that is due to them because this is what and how they dishonored the Sabbath right they lost that awe and haba for that day which was to mark the remembrance of Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala Another great sin of Bani Israel was their ingratitude that they displayed over and over again, right? And this is not a minor detail, right? This was huge and it is something that we certainly cannot feel safe from or immune from falling into, right? Pride that uh, overtook Bani Israel, right? It was part of their pride that uh, their stubbornness that would not allow them to pay heed to the their admonishers, including the ones that were telling them to stop violating the Sabbath, right? Uh, again, pride is something we're totally liable to, especially if we look at how pride manifests itself in us as Muslims in our communities, right? We defined pride from a prophetic hadith, how it is rejecting the truth disdainfully, right? Um, when it's pointed out to us and it clashes with what we are doing, the way that we are behaving, to reject it, right? Um, so that uh, disdain for the truth or rejecting the truth, that's actually what pride is. So we certainly cannot feel immune uh, from that tendency either. So unfortunately what happens to Bani Israel is that they go from being the chosen people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the time of Musa alayhi salam to a people whose destiny then becomes one of persecution and punishment, right? Maldud al he has a footnote on this. He says, since the 8th century BC, the Israelites were warned consistently, they need to desist from their behavior. This is borne out by the contents of the books of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and their successors. Jesus too, Isa Lisan, also administered the same warning, which is borne out by many of his speeches in the New Testament. This was later confirmed in the Quran. History bears out the veracity of the statement made both in the Quran and the earlier scriptures for throughout history since the time the Jews were warned, they have continuously been subject, continually been subjected to abject persecution in one part of the world or another. So just historically we know that this unfortunately is part of their 
tragic um, history. And the verse ends with, indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is la al-iqab. He is indeed swift in punishment, right, for the ones who disobey him. But his attributes of ghufran, of mercy, of forgiveness are always there for those that uh, repent to him. The door is always open, even from these former communities, if they were to, um, or these particular communities, if they were to repent and return, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there to accept it. Uh, the repentance of any of his servants once they realize and come back to him. Okay, let's look at verse 168. Uh, verse 168. And we scattered them in the earth as different groups. From among them are the righteous and from among them other than that, not righteous. وَبَلَوْنَاهُمْ And we tried them بِالْحَسَنَاتِ With good وَالسَّيِّئَاتِ And with evil or afflictions لَعَلَّهُمْ So perhaps they يَرَجَعُونَ May return 168 And we dispersed them through the earth in communities Some were righteous, others were not And we tested them with prosperity and adversity That they may revert into righteousness, right? So 168 so the first punishment that was mentioned in the previous verse was how they would have rulers um, made over them that would subject them to these uh, horrific, uh, you know, um, humiliating punishments. The second punishment that they receive is that they were scattered throughout the world in such a way that their power, their unity was broken and also scattered as Qurtubi Rahimullah mentions in his tafsir, scattered like refugees in the land. And we all know uh, about this, right? And Emmerich refers to how the tragic Jewish diaspora, which was accomplished in two phases, first by the Babylonians, later by the Romans, caused Jewish populations to be scattered over the known world, right? And this is what actually uh, has happened uh, historically is common knowledge. So what is the lesson in this for us? Such a frightful end. Such a frightful end awaits any people or nation who neglect and throw behind their backs the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after having once honorably received them. Something that is completely, totally applicable to us as uh, the Muslim community, as the Muslim community bearers of the uh, Quranic message, right? And the verse mentions how there were righteous people among them as well, right? They weren't all bad, obviously, right? Um, the righteous and not so righteous existed among them. And, um, you know, the righteous, of course, were those people that uh, stopped uh, Bani Israel uh, from breaking the Sabbath, right? The Muslims of that time. And later, those who believed in our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from, uh, you know, that community, they're also among the uh, righteous, right? Like Abdullah bin Salam, who um, be became Muslim in the time of the Rasul, you know, uh, he was uh, one from the Jewish community that recognized the uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he became Muslim and believed in him. So definitely there have been righteous from among them in their uh, communities in the time of Musa Alayhi Salam, those that did not worship the calf, those uh, in the time of the Sabbath breakers who exhorted the Sabbath breakers to not violate it, as well as those of the Jews who believed in uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became Muslim. And of course they were tried with uh, good times and bad times uh you know these two phases um that all nations are tested and tried with the gift of abundance to see if they will be thankful and the trial of hardship to see if they will be patient and return to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leave off their sinfulness so um Sheikh Zuhayli, he mentions that the um and the understanding we should have is that both these things blessings as well as trials, they both call one to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're different forms, but they call to the same goal. They, it is Allah's way of calling us back to him, right? One through encouraging hope and the other through fearful warning, okay? Um, let's look at 169. Then came after, mim, after, ba'dihim, them, Khalf ba'dihim is literally after them, so you, this is not how you would say it in English, right? But this is literally min is from ba'dihim after them. Khalfun, 
a successive generation. Warithu, who inherited Al Kitab, the book. Yaqhuluna, they would take Arada, uh, the goods, Hadha al Adna, of this lower, referring to the dunya. Wayaqulun, and they would say, Sayyogfarulana, we shall be forgiven. Wa in yatihim aradu mithlu wa in and if yatihim comes aradun, yani the goods of this world, mithlu, the likes of it, yaqhudu, they also take that as well. Alam, don't they see? Yu'khad, uh, was not taken. That is actually a better way to understand it. Alam, yu'khad, was not. Yu'khad is taken alayhim, upon them or from them. Mithaq, the covenant, al-kitab, the book. The covenant of the book. And what was that covenant? Allah, that they would not, yaqulu, say, ala Allahi, regarding Allah, illa al-haq, except the truth. Wa darasu, and they studied ma, that, fihi, what was in it. والدار الآخرة and the دار or the home or the abode of the آخرة خير للذين يتقون خير better للذين for the ones يتقون adopt the path of piety أفلا don't you then تعقلون have uh, use your intellect right verse 169 then others succeeded them who inherited the scriptures and yet kept themselves occupied in acquiring the goods of this world and kept saying, we shall be forgiven. And when there comes to them an opportunity for acquiring more of these goods, they seize it. Was not the covenant of the book taken from them that they would not ascribe to Allah anything but the truth? And they have read what is in the book and know that the abode of the hereafter is better for the God-fearing, do you not understand? Okay, so that was verse 169. After this community of Bani Israel came then their descendants, and these included, you know, um, descendants of the righteous people that were mentioned in the previous verse, as well as descendants of the not-so-righteous people that were mentioned in the previous verse, right? So anyhow, these descendants of the good and not-so-good people, they inherited the heavenly scripture, they inherited the Torah from their forefathers, right? But their hearts were not attached to the Torah or its teachings, rather they were attached to the life of this world, as we learn from this verse explicitly, okay? So these were the children uh, the, the people were talking about in verse 169 as those who inherited the scripture. These are the children or the descendants of Bani Israel that had been scattered throughout the earth, right? And they're in Arabic, they're referred to as Khalfun, right? Khalfun. The Khalfun or the successive generations came after them. And notice in the Arabic, Khalfun, the lamb, has a sukun, right? The closed mark, the sukun and the lamb. So when there is a sukun and the lamb, then Khalfun refers to those people who come after another people, but they are evil people, okay? So the ones that succeed a previous generation and they are not good. The, any of the succeeding generation is not a good generation. It is rather an evil uh, generation. So it is one, um, it is a succeeding generation that is evil in its deeds, okay? Uh, so this was an interesting linguistic point because if the word, um, was not khalfun and was khalafun with a fatha and the lamb, then it means people who come after their previous forefathers, but they are good people, okay? So a succeeding generation that is pious is called khalafun with a fatha and the lamb, and a succeeding generation that is not pious, that is evil, is called khalfun with a sukun and the lamb. So I thought that was a really interesting linguistic point. So here, the people that are referred to are khalfun with a sukun and the lamb, meaning it was a succeeding generation that was evil. What made them evil? What are their traits that are mentioned here in this verse? Well, they had the Torah, but they hankered after hadhal adana. What is hadhal adana? It refers to dunya. And, and you can hear the word dunya almost in the word adana, right? They're very similar. They're from the same root. Al-Adna literally means the nearest or the lowest or the most inferior, right? So it's a reference to dunya or to the wealth that they were ready to take, whether it was halal or haram, without any religious scruples of, uh, you know, pangs of conscience because of how attached they had grown to um, this world. And Qurtubi mentions this in his 
tafsir that the greed for dunya was not limited to uh, just you know regular wealth, halal uh, wealth, but uh, they were fine with accumulating haram sources of money from bribes or from riba or from illegal possessions, etc. And when they would judge between people, they would show favoritism. They would be completely fine with changing the scripture in order to uh, get a financial gain from the judgment that they would pass, right? And what was even worse or just as worse is that along with all of this, even though they had the knowledge of the truth in the Torah, they knew that this was not acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Along with that knowledge, they kept saying that we will be forgiven. This is what the verse mentioned. Even though they take after hanker after even the haram, forbidden, illegal gains of this world, um, they keep saying that we shall be forgiven. Okay, So this is something that is pointed out uh, in this verse regarding their traits, right? And they based this on the fact that they were God's chosen ones, that he had chosen Bani Isra. They were his beloved ones and the descendants of his beloved prophets, etc. Right? So they held on to this claim to forgiveness in spite of the practical neglect of the next life that they showed in their day to day actions. Right? Maldud al mentions the Jews knowingly commit sins in the belief that being God's chosen people, they will necessarily be pardoned and spared God's punishment. As a result of this misconception, they neither repent nor refrain from committing sins. They received the scriptures which could have made them the leaders of mankind. And yes, at that time, they were the chosen people at the time of Musa, alayhi salam. But because of their uh, attachment to going after the worldly gains, in, in, you know, whether it was halal or haram, they were reduced to this uh, status. Their leadership was taken away from them and they incurred the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa So the lesson for us here is that uh, we need to be aware of the extent of love and attachment that grows uh, within us for um, the life of this world and its uh, pleasures, right? And then the simultaneous tendency we have to feel that we shall eventually be forgiven because la ilaha illallah, because we profess there is no God but Allah, right? So. You know, we have this in the back of our minds that um, because we profess Tawheed, because we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His oneness in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are eventually going to be forgiven, right? So this tendency to, you know, ex expect almost unconditional or ex expect forgiveness, you know, um, is, you know, lurks in our minds as Muslims, as those who are upon Tawheed, uh, even though, you know, um, we may be engaged in persistent sin. So this is something to think about. Um, Qurtubi in the tafsir of this verse mentions that Allah subhanahu wa has in fact condemned those among the Muslims who harbor these characteristics. Okay, so actually he mentions that quite clearly in, in a statement attributed to uh, Ma'ad bin Jabal radiallahu um, anhu. These characteristics are mentioned and this is a part of that statement regarding those people that their actions are driven by greed Fear does not temper them. If they fall short, they say we shall make up for it eventually in the distant future. And if they act sinfully, they say they shall be forgiven anyway for we do not associate anyone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I added some parenthetical explanations to that, right? The original states that their actions are driven by greed. Fear does not temper them, right? So their greed and the lust for this world is driving their actions and they're not checked by fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they fall short, they say we shall make up for it. And I added to that this um, you know, perception of we're going to make up for it eventually. Sometime in the distant future, I will repent. And the statement says if they act sinfully, they shall say we will be forgiven. Right? Anyway, because we don't associate anyone with Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does this not sound exactly like what we hear all around us, right? As Muslims, as people, um, you know, sin, and we may be among uh, these individuals, right? And falling into this mental, um, you know, line of reasoning, that we'll repent later. Allah is al rahim right? So something really to uh, look out for. Because the description of the righteous that the Quran gives us is that even though, as they are doing good, even while they're busy in doing good, their hearts tremble. Right? They don't know um, about 
how and if their actions are acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Tul Mu'minun records verse 60, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَى رُبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ right? And who do whatever good they do with their hearts fearful, knowing that they will return to their Lord. So even as they are doing good, they have this fear of, you know, this consciousness that they are going to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even as Ibrahim alayhi salam is laying, raising the foundations of the Kaaba, he is concerned about qubul, about the acceptance of that act and making dua for its acceptance, right? So this is the sign of the righteous and a distinguishing marker of the uh, muttaqin, right? That even as they are doing good, they are fearful, um, concerned about acceptance, hoping for it, declaring no guarantees, claiming no guarantees of forgiveness for themselves, but are at the same time humbly hopeful for that um, acceptance and that forgiveness, but cannot guarantee it, can make no claims um, for it, right? In a, a position to the attitude of the arrogant sinner who, while sinning, uh, can arrogantly claim uh, that eventually they will be forgiven to justify their behavior for continuing neglect. That's all what it is, right? That it's just a um, way to justify and continue that behavior. They have studied the book, as this verse uh, mentioned, right? Bani Israel, their descendants, they had studied the book, they knew what was in the Torah, yet they lied against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of uh, worldly gain. What was that lie that they're going to be forgiven anyway, even uh, a persistent sinner like that, them? Uh, they claimed that we would be forgiven anyway. So Maldud he writes regarding this, the people of Israel know well that the Torah does not unconditionally assure them salvation. They have never been promised by God or any of his prophets that they will attain deliverance no matter what they do. Therefore, they have absolutely no right to ascribe to God something which he never told them. What makes their crime even worse is that their claim to unconditional salvation constitutes a sacrilege of their covenant with God, whereby they pledge never to attribute any false statement to God. Okay, There is no unconditional promise of forgiveness for them in the Torah, right? For one who persists in sin, right? So Haiti mentions how forgiveness is only possible for the one who repents and desists from that sin. Such a person can be um, forgiven and not the one who persists in it and persists in it and then makes false hollow claims about guaranteed uh, forgiveness. So what is the Mithaqul Kitab that is mentioned here in this verse, the covenant um, of the book of the Torah? Number one, that you would never ascribe a lie to Allah subhanahu wa was a lie to deny that major sins would be forgiven without tawbah, without repentance, right? This is the claim that they were making. And number two, the mithaq or the covenant of the book of the Torah required that they would make the truth clear to the people, would explain it to them, would make it clear to them, would not hide it. And number three, the mithaq or the covenant included that they would not change the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a small worldly gain, right? So this in fact contains a warning to any and every group that is willing to compromise their deen for worldly um, consideration. So um, just to be clear, the Torah establishes that major sins can only be forgiven with Tawbah, right? And Tawbah is not just saying Astaghfirullah while continuing in the sin and baselessly hoping for forgiveness and, you know, making a claim for uh, forgiveness uh, that it will, it will be guaranteed to them. Uh, the repentance must be there in order for the major sin to be. Uh, forgiven. They knew this, they were very well aware of it, but they continued to attribute this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, so this verse concludes with the nature of the righteous ones, right? The muttaqeen, they, for them, the next world is far superior to this world. They are not going to give up the next world for the mere small gains of this world. And the lesson for us here is that Bani Israel were destroyed by their greed for this world and hankering after its gain. So we must beware uh, about our attachment to this life because remember that prophetic warning that we would follow the same path um, that they followed, right? So we must be aware of preferring this life to the next practically. No one will make that claim verbally. 
but practically are we doing that or not in our actions, right? Okay, uh, let's look at verse 170. وَالَّذِينَ يُمَسِّكُونَ بِالْكِتَابِ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ إِنَّ لَا نُضِيعُ أَجْرَ الْمُصْلِحِينَ وَالَّذِينَ and those يُمَسِّكُونَ hold on بِالْكِتَابِ to the book وَأَقَامُوا and establish الصَّلَاةَ the prayer إِنَّ indeed we لا do not نُضِيعُ waste أَجْرَ الْمُصْلِحِينَ the أجر the reward of those who seek to rectify right verse 170 those who hold fast to the book and establish prayer we shall not allow the reward of such righteous people to go to waste okay verse 170 so um the good people those who hold on to the book who hold on to the commandments of the book practically in their lives and this is you know and referring to the torah who hold on to it and act according to its commands and establish the prayer Although holding on to the book means holding on to all of its commandments, which include the prayer. But the fact that it is mentioned separately shows the supreme importance, the full, the virtue, the superiority of this of this ibadah of the salah, right? Even in the previous sharias, how um, you know it was fundamental uh, to uh, and part of the deen, right? So those who do salah, those who have this attitude of rectification, of setting things aright, of doing things as they should be done, and being steadfast in setting things aright, right? Then this is that preventative trait, that trait that prevents their edge of the reward from being lost in the next world, right? The edge of such people shall never be lost. And these include people who uh, left their deen and became uh, Muslim, right? In the time of Rasul, وسلم, those Jews like Abdullah bin Salam, one who converted from Judaism and became Muslim in the time of Rasul, وسلم, are included in this uh, beautiful verse. Okay, let's look at verse 171. Okay, I'm going to transition into um, this passage 171. When we shook Al Jabal, the mountain, above them, كَأَنَّهُ as if it غُلَّةٌ as if it was a canopy وَغَنُّ and they were sure أَنَّهُ that it وَاقَعُمْ would fall be him was, would fall over them خُذُوا take ما what آتَيْنَاكُمْ we have given you بِقُوَّةٍ with قوة with strength with determination وَذْكُرُوا and remember ما that فيه which is in it لَعَلَّكُمْ so that that the Qun, you may adopt piety. Verse 171. And recall when we shook the mountain over them as though it were a canopy, and they thought that it was going to fall over them, and we said, Hold firmly to that which we have given you, and remember what is in it that you may guard against evil. Okay, what verse 171? What um, here we see uh, in verse 171, and recall when we shook the mountain over them. And this is one translation of Nataqra, we shook the mountain over them. Another uh, translation is we raised, okay, Nataqra, we raised the mountain over them. And this um, incident is also referred to in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse uh, 63, right? Um, and when we took the covenant from you, and from uh, you, O Bani Israel, and we raised over you, Al-Tur, Mount Al-Tur, Take what we have given to you, biqwa, same word, right, with strength. And remember that which is in it so that you may adopt piety, okay? So here, Mount Thur is specifically mentioned, right? Uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had spoken to Musa alayhi we had received uh, the Torah. And um, it is mentioned in some of the tafsirs that when they received the Torah, they found some of its ahkam commandments too difficult. And they actually said that they could not do this, right? Sheikh Zaidi mentions this. So at this point, Allah subhanahu wa caused the mountain to become uprooted from its very roots and it hung over them like a canopy, like a cloud. And they were sure that it was going to fall over them because obviously the mountain cannot remain, remain suspended in the atmosphere. So they were sure it was going to fall over them. So these are the circumstances, right, under which they were told take what you are being given, do what you are being commanded, right? And take what is being revealed to you, take it with strength, and remember what is in it so that you can attain piety, right? Um, and the tafsir mentions how 
taking the ahkam bi quwwa right take it with strength take it with determination treating our deen seriously taking our deen seriously results in taqwa building right it results in purification of the soul it results in enhancement of our akhlaq of our character while being lax in matters of deen right while being you know lazy or a uh, carefree right having a lax a non serious attitude towards them what does that do that induces the nafs to then follow its own desires right um so sometime you know the exhortation to you know the gracious exhortation to work and believe and do good um sometimes it doesn't always uh you know is not always effective for all people sometimes you know some people need that mountain uprooted uh to really drive home the fact that take what is being given to you with strength you know ala alakum that that so that you may adopt piety this will result in piety for you you know taking the commands even if they appear difficult and strenuous um this is uh you must take it with determination and have the intention to um implement that right um so that is a lesson to directly apply what is the attitude we should have towards our deen is it one of seriousness or one of laziness right one of determination or one of laxity and what are going to be the uh, resulting uh, effects of that uh, in our lives right um okay let's look at 172 so 172 really marks the next verse 172 marks the beginning of a new passage here okay um and it's one of the hallmark uh, verses of this sura right verse 172 what id and when akhadha took rabbuka your lord mim bani israil from bani israil mim, uh, i'm sorry mim bani adam not bani israil uh mim bani adam from the children of adam min wuhurihim from their wuhur from their backs dudiyatahum their descendants or their offspring or their progeny wa ashhaduhum and made them bear witness ala anfusihim upon themselves alastu am i not bi rabbikum your lord alastu bi rabbikum am i not your lord qalu they said bala shahidna indeed we bear witness and taqulu lest you would say yawm al qiyamah the day of judgment inna indeed we kunna regarding this we were an hadha regarding this ghafilin negligent or heedless right or unaware so verse 172 and recall when your lord brought forth descendants from the loins of the sons of adam and made them witnesses against their own selves asking them am i not your lord they said yes we do testify we did so lest you should claim on the day of judgment we were unaware of this okay verse 172 so a new passage begins uh here where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recalls to this uh, to us this remarkable event which took place uh you know long before we came to this world um and where all the progeny all human beings that were going to um you know come into existence until the day of judgment they were all taken out from the backs of the descendants of adam alayhi salam so generation upon generation of humanity until the last day was all assembled in one area where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them alastu bi rabbikum am i not your lord okay so maudu that he allah ta'ala mentions how um, in the previous verse the mithaq or the covenant that was taken from bani israil is mentioned and here the mithaq or the covenant that was taken from all of humanity including bani israil is mentioned here right um all of humanity is under this covenant uh, with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right that timeless ahd that timeless covenant that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took uh, for us at um at, at that you know uh, upon that remarkable event upon the creation of adam alayhi salam and it is not a symbolic uh incident or metaphorical incident right all of humanity was actually brought about into being at the same time to testify regarding the lordship of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we could recognize and know our lord and the fact that this event is um one of the proofs against people on the day of judgment 
is an evidence in itself of the fact that it was a physical event, not a metaphorical uh, incident, okay? Um, or not a metaphorical concept. And there's actually a Hassan um, Sahih hadith in the collection of Matirmadi, rahimahullah ta'ala, where the Rasul said what means when Allah created Adam, he wiped his back and every person that he created among his offspring until the day of resurrection fell out of his back, right? He placed a ray of light between the eyes of every person. Then he showed them to Adam Islam, and he said, O oh Lord, who are these people? He said, these are your offspring. He saw one of them whose ray between his eyes amazed him. So he said, O oh Lord, who is this? He said, this is a man from the latter nations of your offspring called Dawood. He said, Lord, how long did you make his lifespan? He said, 60 years. Okay. So uh, the narration mentions when Allah created Adam, he wiped his back and every person that he created from his offspring until um, the day of resurrection fell out of his back. Um, just note that uh, the, what the verse is actually saying is that when your Lord brought forth descendants from the loins of the sons of Adam, السلام, right? So they were brought forth from the loins of the sons of the progeny of Adam السلام, so just be uh, aware of the wording so the covenant that we entered into with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time what was that covenant that he alone Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is our Lord that there is no God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we may you know ask what is the purpose of this testimony if we cannot remember when it occurred, if we can, if we don't know the time, we don't know the place that you know this occurred. Then what, um, what is the purpose of even mentioning it, right? Yes, it is something that occurred at a time that we cannot recall consciously, but its effects lurk in the recesses of our being, in what is called the fitra, right? Um, it has been retained as Maududi comments. It has been retained in the subconscious mind. And I was listening to a lecture on this um, and it beautifully uh, gave an example on how um, when your mother talks to you about, uh, remember when you were little, I asked you, uh, will you always remember me? Will you always take care of me? Will you always fulfill my rights? You know, once you're older. Um, remember I said that to you when you were little, right? Now, you as an adult don't remember that time when your mother asked you that question, right? But uh, no one questions their the parentage of their parents once they're older just because we don't remember that these individuals we call mom and dad were our parents from the very beginning, right? Uh, we don't have that memory uh, from where we knew from day one that these are our parents. We didn't have that memory, right? But no one has to um, prove to us that these two individuals we call mom and dad are in fact our parents, right? So it is something that is embedded in the fitra of the human being, okay? So this um, event, even though we don't remember it consciously, yet it has been retained in the subconscious mind. And if we had retained the memory of this consciously, then there would have been no test, right? There, If everyone had fully remembered it, then the whole element of test would be removed from the life of this uh, world, right? But how do we know that it happened? How we, you know, uh, we still have proof of the fact that it happened? It's because of our fitra, the nature of the human being, which yearns to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has always done so from the beginning of time, right? Uh, where people have always wanted to worship whether they were guided in this desire or not. Uh, but they wanted to worship whether it was the sun or the stars or the trees or the moon until the light of revelation came and they were introduced to the uh, way that they began to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single human being has um, this fitra that they were born upon, which is the reason that even an atheist calls out to God on a sinking ship right which is why the quran is called a reminder which is why prophets are people who remind um about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right um you can only be reminded of something that you used to know at one point but you may have forgotten because of your upbringing or because of your parents religion or because of your environment but once you're reminded of that once you are shown 
or granted the revelation once you are shown the proofs you can recall and remember once again right so you can only be reminded of something you already once knew about right um so this is proof um, of the fact that this uh, actually physically occurred the fitra right uh why they say that there are no atheists on the battlefield right um and this recognition of the truth uh, is possible because of this mithaq. People who convert to Islam, people who are able to recognize the truth, it's because of um, this fitra that is embedded uh, in them because of this mithaq. And so the room, verse 30, mentions fitrat Allah. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفَ فِتْرَةَ اللَّهَ الَّتِي خَلَقَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا So be steadfast in faith in all uprightness, O Prophet, the natural way of Allah, fitrat Allah, which He has instilled in all people. This is why regardless of how materialistic we become, how godless our society becomes, atheists still remain a numerical minority in the world right according to global sociological studies about as of 2020 only about seven percent of the world was atheist which means 93 percent still believe in god right um so in other words all efforts to remove memory of god or the memory of the mithaq right um they have failed all efforts of materialism and uh, capitalism and any other ism, right? Atheism, communism, all of these combined and more have failed to efface the impress of this inherent knowledge from the human heart, as Maududi Rahimallah Ta'ala puts it, right? And its whole purpose, the whole purpose of this mithaq was to give us the ability to know and recognize our Lord, right? Once we knew him and acknowledged him and his lordship, it would then, um, you know, that would be the memory that would allow us in our fitrah to then recall and remember him once again uh, in the life of this world when we were sent here. And so that no one on the Day of Judgment could have the excuse that uh, we were unaware of this. We didn't know, right? Um, in fact, on the Day of Judgment, all instances of where the human being had deliberately tried to suppress his or her fitrah for the sake of this world and its gains, those uh, actions of suppressing our fitra actually are going to count as evidences against the human being, right? Because deep down inside, uh, we know, right, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. And it is because of this mithaq that he took from us, you know, uh, in time immemorial that uh, we are, as the Prophet told, uh, has told us, each and every one of us is born upon that uh, fitra, right? <laughs> Okay, we have time to refer just to one more verse, verse 173, verse 173. Oh, oh, that you would say, Innama indeed Ashraka uh, made uh, committed shirk Aba'una, our forefathers, min qablu from before. Wa kunna and we, dhurriyatan, we were um, their descendants, min ba'dihim after them. Afatuhlikuna, will you destroy us, bima, because of what fa'ala did? Al Mubutilun, right? The unrighteous ones before. So verse 173, or say it was our forefathers before us who associated others with Allah in his divinity. We were merely their offspring who followed them. Would you destroy us for the deeds of the unrighteous? Okay, verse 173. So the Mithaq was taken from us so that we would not have this excuse that, you know, uh, or people would not have this excuse that they were simply following the deen of their forefathers you know our forefathers were committing shit we were born into that how can we possibly be held accountable for something that um you know they didn't we just followed them in that are you going to destroy us for what our forefathers um did right so this covenant this mithaq internally placed within us the ability to recognize allah subhanahu wa and his oneness um, that sound fitra that all of us are born with so blindly following uh, those that came before us when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to deen is simply not acceptable Shaykh Zaini mentions this that blind following is not permitted in matters of iman in matters of faith each individual is responsible for using the intellect that they were born with and not to block out 
that fitra that was implanted in them through the mithaq that comes out every now and then, even as we said um, among atheists, right? We could uh, call out to God on a uh, sinking ship. So the fact that, um, you know, uh, this covenant, because of which we have this fitra, this covenant, this mithaq, uh, this fitra that resulted from it, is what brings people back to the fold of tawheed once they do uh, convert, right? People who just cannot accept shirk, people with whom the Trinity does not sit well, they just cannot settle or accept uh, the discrepancies that shirk and um, you know the Trinity and any violation of though he brings uh, you know into their lives, into their souls. What is it that brings them into the fold of Islam, into the fold of Tawheed? It's that fitra that keeps gnawing at them, keeping them restless in search of the truth. As one convert explains in her discovery of Islam. That this is what Christianity, she said, this is what Christianity was supposed to be, right? Once she found Islam, this was her comment, right? Pure, pristine, uh, tawheed, uh, the worship of one God, fitratullah alladhi khalaqan nasa alayha, right? The fitra, um, fitratullah alladhi fatara nasa alayha, right? The fitra of Allah which he has instilled, fatara, he has instilled, uh, placed in all people, okay? So inshallah with that, we conclude um with verse 173 uh we only have a few lectures left so please uh catch up if you need to and um with that we will see you next week subhanahu wa bihamdika la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh